Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. We've been working our way through a series of controversial questions like identity, gender, uh, sexuality, and abortion. But the question, the deeper question underneath all of those questions is this. What does it mean to be a human being? Your answer to that question is called your anthropology. Anthropos is the Greek word for human. Whether you've ever thought about this or not, you have an anthropology because we all have an answer to the question, what does it mean to be a human being? In fact, your answer to this question will determine the way you answer all the other questions about identity, gender, sexuality, and things like that. In fact, the reason those questions are so controversial is because people have different beliefs about what it means to be a human being. So throughout this series, I've been encouraging us to slow down the conversation about these particular questions and to think more deeply about our anthropology. Um, and that's why this week we need to talk about technology. Why is that? It's easy to think, well, human beings, we're the ones who shape technology, which is true. We're the ones who conceive it. We're the ones who produce it. But it's also true that technology shapes us oftentimes without us even being aware of it. For instance, in the ancient world, ancient monasteries used to ring a bell seven times a day when it was time to pray. But then in the 12th century, they invented the clock. The clock was invented as a way of helping monks be more regulated in their prayers. But eventually the clock left the monastery and entered the factory. So now, instead of being a way of helping people be more devoted to God, it became a way of regulating working hours and maximizing profit ratios for business owners. In fact, some people have suggested that without the clock, modern capitalism would have been impossible. The clock completely transformed the way we experience time and our life in this world. So now, instead of the clock serving human beings, Human beings serve the clock. How much of your life uh, is shaped by an uh, ever-present awareness of the hours and the minutes and the seconds ticking by? How much of your life is shaped by an undercurrent of anxiety that you're not moving fast enough, you're not getting enough done, you're running out of time? That's all of us. Technology is not just something human beings shape. Our technology shapes us. So, for instance, Melvin Kranzberg uh, was a historian. He was actually born here in St. Louis. He's very famous for writing something known as the Six Laws of Technology. You know what law number one is? Technology is neither good nor bad, but nor is it neutral. Technology shapes us. Technology tells us a story about what it means to be a human being. And oftentimes, we're completely unaware of the story that our technology is uh, telling us. So, what is technology? How does it shape us? And what do we do with all of that? 
This passage we just read is one of the best places to help us think about that. So let's take a look at it under three headings. We're going to see this morning the goodness of technology, the problem of technology, and finally the redemption of technology. The goodness, the problem, and the redemption of technology, all right? First, let's look at the goodness of technology. This story is a famous story about a city called Babel. At its heart, it's a story of human arrogance and pretension against God. And we'll talk about that. But first, it's important for us to see something else. Uh, in verse 3, this, um, they say, come, let's make bricks. In verse 4, they continue by saying, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower. Notice there's a lot of making and building going on here. In other words, there's a lot of technology. In fact, brick making and tower building would have been considered cutting-edge technology back then. Um, in fact, here's what's going on here. Uh, notice that in this story, God comes down and, and, and he judges them. He confuses their language and scatters them across the face of the world. So we might think, well, this is telling us that technology is bad. But that's not the case at all. It's much more nuanced than that. The Bible has many different words for making and building. This passage uses three of those words. But there's another word that the Bible never uses to talk about human making. It's a word that's only used to talk about God. Um, and that word shows up uh, at the very beginning of the Bible. In the very first verse in Genesis chapter 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This word created is the Hebrew word bara, which means um, to create something, uh, normally out of nothing. So this word is used 41 times in the Bible, and every single time this word is only used to talk about God's creation. Here it refers to God's creation of the material universe out of nothing. Friends, only God does bara. Only God creates out of nothing. Um, that means that the raw materials of this world, that, that all human making, all other kinds of making, can only use the raw materials that God has already created. It's kind of like that famous joke about the scientist who told God, hey God, we don't need you anymore. We can create life just like you. And God says, oh really? Why don't you show me? How about you create a human being? And so the scientist leans over and picks up a handful of dirt, but God says, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Get your own dirt. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. I think it's funny. <laughs> I thought it was actually a pretty corny joke, and it's going to be <laughs> crickets out there. <laughs> Thank you. But here's the point. Only God creates out of nothing. All the physical stuff in this world, all the atoms and the molecules and the clumps of dirt and the strands of DNA, all of that is created by God and only by God. But here's the amazing thing. When God creates bara, the first humans, he puts them in the garden and he says, keep the garden, tend it, cultivate it. I want you to take the raw materials of this earth and, and cultivate them into something beautiful. So, for instance, if you were to walk over to Forest Park, it's one of the most beautiful parks in the world. Consistently makes top ten lists of best parks all over the world. And you go over there and you'll see flowers. If you go at the right time of year, you will see manicured walkways and gardens. You'll see the Grand Basin and the pagoda in the middle of this beautiful pond. It's phenomenal. But it didn't just spring up out of the ground like that. Somebody had to make it. In fact, it took a group of people working together to take the raw materials of the earth and cultivate it into something beautiful. So when God creates the first human beings, all human beings, he's basically telling us, look, I want you to take the raw materials of this material creation that I created and only I can create, I want you to take them and to recombine them in new ways, in innovative ways, in creative ways. Now, friends, here's the point. Technology is the recombining of God's material creation in innovative ways that add value to human life and bring honor to God. We were created to do that. In fact, this is part of what it means to be a human being created in God's image. Because God is a creator. God is an 
artist. God is a coder. God is a designer. God is an engineer. But if that's true, think about that. If God is a creator and human beings are created in his image, don't you realize what that means? J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, had a wonderful way of putting this. He calls this subcreation. Human beings are created in the image of God, the true creator, so that we might be what Tolkien called subcreators. We were created to do this. Now, here's why this is so important. It's very common for, especially religious people, to have this idea that physical and material reality is bad. Or at least inferior or not that important, but spiritual reality is good. That's what's really important. You see this idea throughout history, and you see it all over the world. You see it in Eastern spiritualities like Vedic traditions or Buddhism. You also see it in the West with Greek philosophy like Gnosticism or forms of Platonism. It's over and over again, however, uh, from beginning on the first page of the Bible, every time God creates something, whether it's the land or the sea or the stars or the sky, every single time God creates something, he says, this is good. This is good. Oh, behold, this is very good. As far as I've ever been able to discover, only the Bible puts this kind of emphasis on the goodness of God's material creation. And not just the goodness of God's creation, but the goodness of human sub-creation. We were created to be makers and builders. So before we move on, let me offer you just a couple of thoughts by way of application. First, this affirms the goodness of all different kinds of work. It affirms the goodness and the dignity of all different kinds of work. For instance, the first humans were manual laborers. You know, they had their hands in the dirt. They were gardeners, but they were also creatives. They were innovators because of the way they were cultivating the garden. That means that whatever you do, whether your hands hold a shovel to dig ditches or your fingers are typing on a computer keyboard in an office or a laboratory somewhere, it means that whatever you do, all kinds of work done for the glory of God have dignity in the eyes of God because it's a way of being sub-creators. Second, this is showing us that technology is also good because technology is part of God's good creation. It's part of the way that that God um, has entrusted us to cultivate the raw materials of his creation in this world. So in this passage, you notice how the the city builders say, or it says of them, that they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. That word tar is talking about, um, it was an adhesive, and it was part of the technology that they used to build the city of Babel. Now, In this story, they're building this city for their own glory, not the glory of God. But that doesn't mean the technology itself is bad. For instance, if you go back to Genesis 6, when God tells Noah to build an ark in order to save humanity, he tells him to to use pitch or tar to seal the ark. It's the same technology. This means that, that technology in and of itself, it's part of God's good creation. It can be used for good or it can be used for ill. But the problem is not with the technology, but with the ways that we humans use the technology. And that leads to our second point. We've just seen the goodness of technology, but next we need to look at the problem of technology. In this story, um, the city builders say, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may Make a name for ourselves. Now, when they say, make a name, yes, they mean pretty much the same thing that we mean when we say, I got to make a name for myself. Every single one of us longs for a sense of meaning and significance, for a sense that my life in this world matters. That's what it means to have a name. Having a name means that there is something unique and special about you. And we all long for that. We all need that. We were created for that. Now, in this story, God comes down and he judges them for that. He confuses their language and scatters them all over the earth. But that doesn't mean that cities are bad or towers are bad. It doesn't mean that technology is bad. The problem is not with the technology, but the way humans use the technology. 
So let me explain it like this. One of the most helpful little books of theology I've ever read is a book by a guy named Al Walters, and it's called Creation Regained. In this book, Al Walters says that if you really want to understand the world, then it is absolutely crucial to understand the difference between two things, structure and direction. Let me explain what that means. Structure is a way of referring to God's the good st- creation. It's a, the creational structure of God's cre- creation, which we've just seen is good. In fact, it's very good. It's a way of talking about this created world as God intended it to be. Um, everything about this world, creation is good. And so um, that's referring to all different kinds of things in this world that could be referring to human functions like emotions or intellect or love. But it could also be referring to cultural goods like <clears throat> science or agriculture or art or technology. All of those things have the potential for good because all of them are parts of God's good creational structure. Does that make sense? Okay, direction, on the other hand, is a way of talking about the ways that we humans direct the things of God's creation um, either toward God or away from God. Direction is a way of talking about the way that we direct the things of God's creation. We can either direct them toward God and his intentions, or we can direct them away from God and his intentions. But here's the point. Creation is good. All of our problems in this world, they are not problems with God's creation. That's what Gnosticism says. Our problems in this world are not with creation, but with the ways that we humans direct God's creation either away or especially, especially away from God. So let me give you an illustration of this from technology. Many of you have probably seen the Netflix movie, The Social Dilemma. At the very beginning of that movie, uh, they're interviewing several of the people who actually invented the technology. These would be people from Facebook, Instagram, Apple, Google, YouTube, and Twitter. One of the people they interview uh, is the person who, um, he was um, head of the development platform at Twitter for five years. Another person they interview helped uh, to invent Google Drive, Gmail Chat, and, my favorite, the like button on Facebook. (laughs) These are the people who invented the technology of social media. And all of them say at the very beginning, they saw so much potential for good. They helped reunite lost family members. They found organ donors for people. But then, one after another, they they talk about how um, they begin to see all the harmful and destructive consequences of it. And how each one of them left the industry because of the ethical concerns and the unintended consequences. In fact, um, one of them says that, you know, there really is no one bad guy here. There's, There's really no one person to blame for all of this. But then the interviewer asks a really good question. The interviewer asks, so what is the problem? In fact, the interviewer asks every single one of the interviewees, what's the problem then? And every single one of them is like a deer in headlights. Every single one of them is just looking helplessly into the camera at a total loss for words, because they know there's a problem, but they have no framework for describing the problem. Friends, the Bible has a framework. It says creation is good. God's creational structure is good, and that means that the creational structure of technology is also good. The problem is not with the structure of technology, but with the direction, the way that we humans direct the technology away from God and his intentions. But we also need to remember that technology itself is not neutral, as Melvin Kranzberg taught us. It shapes us. It tells us a very powerful story about what it means to be a human being. In fact, just as a clock shapes the way that we experience time, all technology, especially digital technology, shapes the way we interpret what it means to be a human being. So let me give you a couple of the many ways that digital technology shapes the way we experience this world and interpret our lives as human beings. First, digital technology trains us to think that faster is always better. And technology has made us very fast. For instance, when the radio was invented, it took 
38 years to reach 50 million listeners. When television was invented, it only took 13 years to reach 50 million viewers. But when the internet was invented, do you know how long it took to reach 50 million users? Four years. This world is getting faster. Philosophers call this social acceleration. Do you ever feel like the world is getting faster and faster and faster? That's part of what it means to, to live in a digital age. That digital technology teaches us that faster is always better, that efficiency is always better and, and is good just for the sake of efficiency. Second, digital technology teaches us that more information is always better. But as human beings, we can only process so much information. But not only is there more and more information coming at us, uh, that information has no context. It's just like raw data coming at us all the time. How do you distinguish between the significance of, of different pieces of information? I was just talking to somebody before the service. And he said, did you hear, you know, they replaced the CEO of ChatGBT or something like that? How do you discern, you know, you got this information. How do you discern whether or not that's more important than what's going on in Gaza right now? It's just raw data coming at us. What do we do with that? Or for instance, you know, a tweet, if that's what we even call it anymore. A tweet, by definition, is a piece of raw information without any context. It's just there in a bubble, hanging free. There's no context, which means there's no meaning. One of the things this does is very subtly and subconsciously, it teaches us that this world is an essentially meaningless place. So that if you want to find meaning and significance, if you want to find a name for yourself, then you have to create that for yourself. And one of the main ways we do that is through our social performance in this world, including, maybe especially including, our performance on social media. Friends, listen, efficiency and information are both good things. They're wonderful things when they're used in the service of God and in the service of other human beings. But when efficiency and information become absolutes, when they become a good in and of themselves for their own sake and not for the sake of anything else, when they become an end in and of themselves, then efficiency and information start to shape us in ways that are actually directing us away from God's creational structure and his intentions for our lives. What does it mean to be a human being? In a digital age, we're being trained to think that we are production machines. That, that the only way your life can have meaning and significance is if you're producing more, is if you are accomplishing more, is if you're optimizing your life, as we say, as if we're processing more information and we're doing all of that faster and faster and faster. Do you ever feel that? I think we all do, but what do we do with it? Well, that leads to our last point. We've talked about the goodness of technology. It's part of God's good creation. We've seen the problem of technology. It's when we take the structural um, goodness of God's creation and we direct it away from God and his intentions. But lastly, we need to see the redemption of technology because, yes, there is good news here. You know, one of the biggest challenges um, in our world with technology is that there is a, um, an ideological battle between tech optimists and tech pessimists. So the city builders in this story, they would have been tech optimists. You know, they say, hey, let's make a city, let's make a tower, let's make a name for ourselves. They were hugely optimistic about uh, the possibility that all of our problems as uh, human beings could be solved by technology. Many people today feel the exact same way. For instance, when I was a kid, one of my favorite TV shows was The Six Million Dollar Man. It was all about a NASA astronaut who crashed. And when they pulled his body out of the wreckage, his body was destroyed. So what do they do? Every week in the, the opening theme credits, you would hear a voice that says, Steve Austin, astronaut, a man buried alive. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We can make him better, stronger, faster. And then you see them putting bionic chips in his arms and his legs. And you see him running 60 miles an hour. And every time he would do something cool and bionic, there would be a really cool sound effect. I loved that show. 50 years ago, that sounded very science fiction-y. Not anymore. 
Have you ever heard about transhumanism? The philosophy has been around for centuries, but especially over the last 30 years, it's, it's evolved into a very um, sophisticated and well-developed movement that, that is very optimistic about the possibility of technologically augmenting human beings, technologically augmenting our bodies, and possibly even transcending death one day. I mean, this is, the people are very optimistic about the possibilities of technology to solve all the problems of the world. But on the other hand, there are many people who are what we could call tech pessimists. Many people are deeply afraid that technology, especially digital technology, um, is dehumanizing us and destroying our world. In fact, especially with the advancements in artificial intelligence, many people are very afraid that um, the day is coming when the robots are going to take over the world and all human jobs are going to be replaced and we might even be running for our lives from the robots. This is a very real fear. It's not science fiction. In fact, I mean, just take a look at all the dystopian and apocalyptic films and TV shows that are out there. Many people are tech optimists, but many other people are tech pessimists. And there's real ideological battle between those two things. So here's the question. Is the Bible tech optimist or tech pessimist? Leslie Newbigin was a famous British missionary for many years. Uh, a journalist once asked him, Mr. Newbigin, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And Leslie Newbigin said, I am neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He was talking about where we put our hope, either human power or God's power. May, depending on where you put your hope, you are going to either be full of hope or without hope at all in this world. If we put our hope in human power, then you will either be really optimistic about this world, you know, we can be better, stronger, faster, or you're going to be really pessimistic about this world. Oh no, everything is in decline, the sky is falling, the robots are taking over, but either way, that response is because we have put our hope in human power. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ puts us in a completely different frame because it shifts the focus from human power to God's power, especially God's power to bring beauty out of ashes or hope out of despair or especially to bring life out of death. And we see that in this passage. How does God respond to the tower builders? It says, the Lord came down. God comes down confuses their language, and scatters them all over the earth. In other words, it's a form of judgment, but notice it's a, it's a judgment that's full of grace. Because not only does God not destroy them, <laughs> he doesn't destroy the technology. He puts limits on the technology, because they're going to go build other cities, they're going to go build other towers, but God limits the technology in order to get humans, you and me, to stop trusting in human power, and to start trusting in God's power. In fact, one of the most amazing things about the gospel of Jesus is that God used human technology as part of the way he saved the world. Because centuries after Babel, God came down again. Only this time, God came down as a human being in the embodied person of Jesus Christ. And this time, instead of punishing us humans for our arrogance and pretensions against God, instead, God took the, the punishment that we deserve for all the ways we trust in human power and poured out grace and forgiveness on us so that we could start trusting in God's power. But how was Jesus punished for us? What form did that judgment take? It was a piece of technology. A carpenter took wood and shaped it into a cross. A blacksmith took the technology of metalworking and shaped three metal spikes and a hammer. And the Roman Empire took the creational structure of that technology and directed it into the most hideous, painful, and dehumanizing form of torture and public execution the world had ever seen up until that point. In other words, on the cross, God took the human misdirection of, of, of human um, 
um, technology and used it to bring about the redemption of humanity. On the cross, God took the, the sinful misdirection of subcreation and used it to inaugurate a new creation. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, that's exactly what his resurrected body shows us. It's a foretaste of the new creation that is awaiting not just you and me, but all of creation, all of the universe. And so what does that mean for you and me today? Well, let me offer you just a few more thoughts by way of application. First, I, I want to encourage us that um, we all need to put limits on our technology. Listen, technology is wonderful. It is a gift. Um, personally, every single week when I prepare a sermon, I use a computer in the internet. Uh, because of that technology, I have more information available to me than ever before, and I can get it more quickly than ever before. That's a gift. And hopefully, Lord willing, I'm using that technology and directing it in a way that honors God and serves you. But I need to put limits on my technology use. We all need to put limits on our use of technology. So there are a lot of resources, really helpful resources out there. I mean, there are all kinds of books and things out there today that, that help teach us how to put limits and boundaries on our use of technology, especially digital technology. For instance, how to um, reclaim our attention in a distracted age, because technology makes us distracted. Or how to reclaim connection in a disembodied age, because our interactions are more and more digital nowadays. There are all kinds of resources out there. I encourage us to engage those resources as a ways of helping us learn to put limits on our own technological use. Second, I want to encourage us to pay attention to how technology shapes us. I, I don't think we really pay very much attention to this. In other words, how does a clock shape us? What, is it, what kind of story is that telling us about what it means to be a human being? How does an automobile shape us? How does a shovel shape us? How does a smartphone shape us? What kind of stories are they telling us about what it means to be a human being? I would encourage us to pay more attention to that. And lastly, and most of all, I want to encourage us to create intentional, regular space in our lives to disengage from all technology, whether it's a shovel or a smartphone, and, and to cultivate space in our lives where we can be alone and quiet with God in order to set our hearts on him in hope. The resurrection of Jesus transforms everything. It saves us from naive optimism because it shows us that hu we humans don't have the power to save the world. But it also saves us from despair because it shows us the resurrection is a down payment on the new creation that... Um, and the renewal and the rejuvenation of all of creation that is awaiting you and me and the whole universe. Friends, that means that we can be neither optimists nor pessimists. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Would you pray with me? Abba, we praise you this morning for your good creation. We thank you that all of our problems on this, in this world are not problems with you and your creation. They're problems with the ways that we have directed your good creation away from your intentions for us and for this world. Father, we ask your forgiveness, but we also thank you for your grace. Lord, that even when you come down in judgment, your judgment is full of grace. But even more, you came down not to, not to wield judgment against us. But when you came down in the person of Jesus Christ, you came down to bear judgment for us. We thank you for that. And we pray that you would bring your grace, your forgiveness, your renewal, your redemption more and more into our lives. And help us to take all of the things of your good creation and to um, learn how to put limits on our own technology, to pay attention to how these things shape us. But especially, Father, you, you would help us to uh, spend time with you that we may listen to you and what you tell us about what it means to be a human being, that we might go out into this world and use all the raw materials, our bodies, all the raw materials of this world and everything we do in this world, our work in this world, our technology in this world, that we may use all of it to, um, to add value to the lives of those around us and to bring honor to your name, for we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.